Tonight on Greater Boston, I'm Sue O'Connell in for Jim Browdy. We'll dig into some troubling stories we've seen recently involving kids carrying out violent attacks and whether we should be concerned more broadly. Then later, how one Roxbury Community College student went from speaking not a word of English to giving the valedictorian address at graduation. Plus, why the First Lady calls community colleges one of America's best kept secrets. Overall, violent crime rates in this region have been largely falling over the past couple of years, but more recently there have been some several high-profile incidents carried out by young people, among them the pair of 13-year-old twins who were arrested last week for as many as nine assaults around Boston over the past month, and the five teenagers facing assault charges after police say cell phone video showed them attacking a woman in downtown Crossing a few weeks back. Then there are the accusations of decades of sexual and physical abuse between students at the Mission Hill K-8 through school that city officials voted to shut down last week. And not to mention a national report from Boston University researchers that found kids aged 12 to 17 are now 40% more likely to carry a handgun than they were two decades ago, although those numbers are lower here in Massachusetts. I'm joined by Ruth Zacharin, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, and Jumani Kendrick, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Dorchester-based nonprofit Mission Safe. Welcome to both of you. I, I always want to make sure that we're careful here. Uh, we talk about statistics, we talk about some high profile incidents, but I want to make sure that we're also pre pre presenting a full picture here of what we see as happening from the statistics sent to us. Jumani, obviously any violence in any neighborhood involve kids or adults, we don't want that happening. But there is a feeling that things have been somewhat safer for adults in some ways, and children are reacting in some ways to the obvious stressors that they have living in the environments that they are. Social media, which is also having an impact, and of course the COVID pandemic. Can you tell me what your take on these numbers and uh, these stories are that we just shared with the audience? Absolutely, so you named a number of those things, you know, COVID being one of them, uh, where young people don't have access to these out of school um, programs. You know, and then after school and then during those times of school, um, they don't have access because of the days and times of programs that uh, are operating. You know, COVID has made it in a way where this online learning has been a real big struggle. And so youth and, and students are not going into school on a daily basis, a consistent basis, where they're finding themselves either skipping school or they're leaving school early, which is just giving all this idle time to be in places um, where they should not be. And you know, get into things they should not get into. So COVID is definitely a big one, right? Um, we have a lack of uh, of advocates and case managers on the streets because there's just not enough resources for those, right? You also have a, a huge issue around uh, programs, community programs within the schools themselves. We don't have enough programs within the schools from the community. You know, people don't speak about that enough, but what happens when you have young people and you have a community resources within the school where they're working with them within the school and when they leave the school, they are followed by those people and they're connected to the programs in the community. So when they leave, no matter what time, it could be 10 o'clock, it could be 2 o'clock, they find themselves in those safe places, these community resources, these community programs, after school programs, they find themselves themselves there. Um, and then just in addition, we have a, a, a diversion um, issue where when young people, juveniles are locked up, especially between those teenage ages, they are released based on the discretion of the courts for whatever laws that are put in place. But there's no, um, there's not a lot of diversion. There's, there's strong diversion programs when you do have them, but we have so many young people, we need more. So diversion, COVID, lack of access to uh, community resources, and then having um, community resources within the schools are some of the issues that we're seeing. And Jumani, to, to your point, before COVID hit us, we were seeing, at least in the Boston Public Schools viewpoint, where my, my kid went, um, there weren't enough guidance counselors. There aren't enough nurses. There weren't enough guy, uh, social workers that were involved in the schools before COVID to help children who are navigating difficult times, right? 
Absolutely. I was actually working in uh, BPS prior to coming over to Mission Safe as a director of programs. So I seen it from within BPS and I seen that I could have more influence outside of it, catching them out there versus just in one school. So I thought that I could have a bigger encatchment when I'm outside of the school to catch multiple uh, uh, areas where youth don't have anything going on. So, yeah, it's a big issue. Ruth, the, the, the good news here in Massachusetts is that uh, hopefully our, our gun laws um, have been helping to keep guns out of the hands of, of everyone, especially children. And the bad news is that nationally those numbers don't show that. And the more bad news, if you will, is these ghost guns uh, that folks have um, access to, that they can make guns, 3D guns that are go going on unchecked. What has been your reaction to where we are with crime, especially when it comes to uh, youths participating in um, violent incidents? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, I think a lot about what does prevention mean? Because ultimately, we don't want to just punish young people after something bad has happened. We want to engage in meaningful prevention to ensure that the violence, the traumatic incident doesn't happen at all. And to me, prevention is really about making sure that young people have what they need to be safe and well in the world, whether it's access to education, for youth jobs or safe recreation, and that we're investing in these programs, we're investing in young people uh, to ensure that they do have the resources that they need to be safe and well in the world. So when I see these numbers, and, and the numbers went down for young people in Massachusetts, but as you mentioned, not nationally, what the question that comes up for me is what else do we need to be doing? The adults in the room need to be doing to make sure that young people do have what they need to be safe and well in the world. Jumani, uh, uh, probably about six years ago, five or six years, I live in, in Roxbury, and about five or six years ago, there was a, a, a wep weapon discharge, a shooting, nobody was hurt in, um, uh, in Jamaica Plain. And I was um, out of my car at the time, it was the middle of the afternoon, kids were getting out of school, there was a school bus right there with elementary school kids on the bus uh, who, you know, saw what happened, saw the police come, and I was shocked. I then called my city councilor who took action, that happened to be Tito Jackson at the time, and said, who's, who's making sure that these kids are going home to support services after seeing this violent incident? This would not be tolerated in Weston. This would not be tolerated in, uh, you know, Sherburne or Dover. If there was an incident like this, there would be school counselors right there, and there was action taken. What do we need to do as a society to understand that when violence happens around our children, we need to make sure that they are getting the support both individually and as their families to make sure that they can process what's happening? Well, the thinking that those things in the neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan are normal is the problem. You know, uh, when you have violence in these communities as often as you do, it becomes somewhat of what they will say is normal or the, and, and that's the problem half the time. You know, when we have these incidents and there's no debrief, there is no immediate um, follow-up with young people who witness these type of traumatic events, that's the problem in itself. And those, that, that falls on the adults. That's not the children. The adults are normalizing this or rationalizing it in a way where it's the child's fault. So therefore, they must have done something or they are in the, an environment where this is okay. That is where we have a, the breakdown, right? So we need to change the mentality of that. When these things happen, what is our response? There's a small group of us that do have a response to it. And I commend those people where we're doing the briefings, we're providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, we're doing follow-up. We see what it looks like when a kid is traumatized because it turns into fear, anxiety, and unsafeness. Um, so we have to just have more um, people on the ground to be able to respond to these when these happen. Um, there's just not enough of us that's one of the biggest issues. Having a capacity issue was huge, right? But also doing things to, tr to, to change the, the society that we're living in inf infrastructurally wise, right? Like we don't have the, the economic uh, resources that we need to change why these young people got off the bus right there and that there's nothing going on and that they are just this idle situations where they can now shoot in front of a school bus. There, it's, it came from a, a, a plethora of things of where, why there is all this time on their hands, why there's access to guns so easily, why do they not have 
um, value or there is any value in their community or themselves to where they feel like this is okay. So there's a few things that need to change on the adult side to be able to perpetuate and model what the young people should be doing. Ruth, I always think it's important. I, I'm a firm believer. I don't, I don't care who, who the person is. If, in my, my opinion, if you're under 18, um, 18 and under, and, and you're involved in a crime, you're a victim as much as whomever you happen to be victimized in, in whatever way. That's Absolutely. my firm belief, regardless of what the crime is. And um, I'm, I'm always shocked at how uh, we have in society such a, a sliding scale about depending on who that person is that committed the crime and if we're going to apply that uh, that minor yep. status to them. And it, it, it drives me absolutely crazy. I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to uh, re reducing gun violence, um, are, are there ways that you are able to educate children and teens directly uh, about gun safety, about um, gun laws, you know, understanding how, how severe it is here, especially in Massachusetts, if you get caught breaking a gun law. What are some of the approaches that you're looking at to try and help reduce gun violence from an educational standpoint? Yeah, and I think it's an important question. I appreciate your analysis around young people who have been impacted by violence. And I want to talk first about just a policy issue related to that, because we know that guns are coming into community in all sorts of ways, but we need to better understand that. And one of our legislative priorities is something called the Crime Gun Data Analysis Bill that would better analyze data collected from guns to understand how those guns are landing in communities because we need to know that. We can't make good policy around how we address that unless we understand where that's coming from. And in terms of education for young people, so you know, one example is, and I just really appreciated the language around how violence becomes normalized because we've been thinking a great deal about that. There's a documentary called This Ain't Normal about violence amongst Boston's youth and we've been partnering with the makers of the documentary, Create a Buzz, to hold screenings of the documentary with panel discussions that involve young people, survivors of gun violence, frontline workers, folks who are formerly incarcerated, because we want to change the narrative around young people who have been impacted by violence. We want to talk with young people about the serious nature of this and also recognize that so much of this is based in trauma and not feeling safe in the world. And that when we come together and say, no, this isn't normal, we need to help young people feel safer in the world. We need to attend uh, to their emotional needs, their concrete needs. That's how I think we're gonna move the needle about gun violence. You know, Jumani, I, I had a conversation with one of uh, a, a, a kid who I was waiting at a bus stop with not long ago, and he was he was making some jokes about shooting. It was nothing nothing serious, but I said to him, you know, gunshots hurt a lot, and he didn't he didn't believe me, and it really struck me as one of these conversations, you know, that we have to we watch television. We all watch television. People get shot in the leg and they you know run run eight miles, and we're not doing a very good job communicating the trauma that happens. Uh, when somebody is shot, it's not just get, getting shot in the leg. And I'm just wondering from your experience, what kind of conversations are you having with teens and youth about ways that they can um, be part of preventing violence and understanding that you know, there can be a new normal that will make all of us safer? Well, I think that, you know, as a person who has been a victim of violence and gunshot wound, and so it does hurt, right? <laughs> um, so when... I hear this all the time. They, they, you know, what they have not experienced, they cannot actually um, speak logically to. So that happens a lot, right? But what's happening and why they may have that mind frame is that the people that they are idolizing are glorifying some of these things, incarceration, um, committing acts of violence, um, being victimized, right? They are glorifying those things. But the actuality is when they are injured or they're incarcerated, the, the story that is not being told is that the sleepless nights, the fear, um, the pain, the self-medication, right? Those things are happening. Um, the loneliness, right? And so what we're doing is, one, we're giving them the actuality for them to actually become uh, um, a person that they are idolizing, that normalizes expressing the pain and the heartbreak of the actual situations versus ignoring them and then only speaking on the so-called good parts of, you know, what happens, right? 
when they see it from someone they idolize, then it's okay for them to speak about the hardships of what happens when you're injured or you're someone that is being peer pressured into gang um, 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 activity, right? Um, what we're doing now is that we're creating peer model, you know, programming so that they're going out and they're speaking the same thing to their peers so that therefore it does not seem less than or they are seen the the they're, they're outcasted because what they're speaking is not cool, you know? So we're trying to change what is cool. We're trying to change what the value is of speaking honestly about hardships and not, um, um, what did they say, hurting in silence, right? Mm-hmm. That's what's happening. We're trying to change that so therefore that they can lean on their sisters, brothers, peers, aunts, uncles in their community so that it's not something that they're going through by themselves, you know? And that's how we're looking at this because they're just idolizing people and they're repeating what they're doing, and those are mostly uh, negative behaviors. And so we're just trying to change those by modeling and positive Well, I, I appreciate both of you for joining me and letting us take a look behind these headlines and hope to pay attention to, to kids and violence every day of the week, not just when it's in the news. Ruth Zakarin and Jumani Kendrick, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, it's no secret that students have had to battle against a pandemic and remote learning over the past two years to earn their degrees. And this year's graduating class from Roxbury Community College is no different. But for some of those walking across the stage this Friday, the road to getting their cap and gown was paved with extra hurdles. Among them is the class of 2022's valedictorian and graduation speaker, Shadia Singo, who emigrated from the Democratic Republic of Congo to the United States in 2018. She now graduates with an associate degree in web technology, and she joins me now to share more of her story, along with the Roxbury, Roxbury Community College's interim president, Jackie Jenkins Scott. Welcome to both of you. Congratulations, Shadia. How are you? How excited are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing pretty good, and you? I'm great. Tell me your story. Tell me how you ended up at Roxbury Community College. So um, I got in America, as you said, in 2018, and I was just looking for a college that had, you know, more of Black people because I was just new here and I wanted to feel, you know, integrated. And Roxbury had that diversity, you know, students from everywhere. And I was like, this is where I, where I want to be. Tell, That's me, why I'm here. tell me about your journey here. Tell me about your family. Tell me about um, how supportive they've been of you on this journey through Roxbury Community College. They have been pretty supportive. Now we have to keep in mind that I'm here by myself. I don't have no family here. They're all back home, but they've been very supportive. My father be calling me all the time, checking on me and making sure that I got everything done, you know, that I'm focusing. So yeah, they've been pretty supportive, even my brothers. President Jackie Jenkins Scott, it's a moment for community colleges right now. I'm sure a moment that we've all been waiting for. We're a community college family at at my house. Um, tell Great. tell me a little bit about um, how are, are we? Is it a moment, or am I just being optimistic? Is are are we seeing a moment here where we're we're turning to community colleges in a way we haven't recently? Well, I think it's a moment, and it's not a moment. <laughs> right. And I think we should always be optimistic. Um, of course, the value of community college and the value, particularly for young people like Shadia, of getting a community college education um, at a much lower cost than going on to uh, a four-year college. So, uh, And then students who are able to enroll in what we call dual degree programs and early, age, early college programs uh, can greatly reduce the cost of going to um, college. And as, as you know, nowadays, um, it used to be that a high school diploma could get you uh, a good job and lifelong health benefits and all of those things. And we know now that the entry level to a more secure future is certainly a, a college degree and community. So that's the optimism that, uh, that the value of a community college education is now being um, recognized. But I love Shadia's story. That is what community colleges are for. And um, congratulations, Shadia. You are very brave to be here. Um, Thank you. And uh, I love the fact that you still have the support of your family, uh, even back home, uh, who are yeah. cheering you on and 
supporting you and wanting you to do well. So congratulations. We are so proud of you. And Thank I, you. I know they'll be watching you remotely as you graduate this Friday. Shadi, what's what's the future for you? What after you get your 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 uh, your diploma this Friday? What's next? So I'm actually working as a full time technician at ABCD. So I'm gonna be there and move on, take on the course. Our webmaster is gonna be retiring, and they're getting me ready to get a position. What is pretty amazing, and I'll continue at UMass Boston. Uh, starting fall 2022, and I'll be measuring in computer forensics. That's great. President Jack and Scott, uh -huh. many folks don't understand that there are relationships with the state schools and with some other private universities yes. and colleges. You do two years at a community college here in Massachusetts, and then you can take and transfer your credits to a UMass Boston yeah. or to some other private universities. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the, the, the moment for community colleges. I want to talk about why we're doing that a little bit is because First Lady Jill Biden uh, is an instructor at um, yes. community colleges. Yes, she has taught at community colleges for many years. She had this to say just recently. My wife is a community college professor. She said it's the best kept secret in America. Why, why is it the best kept secret? Why aren't we doing more community college shouting from the rooftops, President? Well, you know, one of the reasons is that community colleges offer such a diverse uh, education for such a diverse population, particularly our underserved populations. Roxbury Community College, over 80% of our students are students of color. Many of them are immigrants. Many of them are come from um, families that, that do not have enough um, you know, resources to send their kids directly on to a four-year uh, private or even public education. So I think people are understanding um, the value of a community college education, uh, and it's a great education. One of the things here at Roxbury Community College is I love the faculty. Uh, their love of, of this student population which is um, a very diverse student population. So it is a pop student, community colleges serve a population that you don't see very often in our traditional higher education uh, institutions. And sometimes um, those are the kinds of things that make um, uh, certain institutions not be as valued as they should be. And that's um, part of our challenge is to tell our story and to help people to understand um, the value of community college education. You know, um, and I think it's, it's so, so important and so exciting. You've used the word value a number of times, and it's an important one, especially uh, at this point in our conversations about uh, secondary education. You've got Boston University increasing their tuition, um, the largest increase they've had. Obviously, many institutions reacting to COVID and all of the challenges that we've all gone through. Uh, we've got the millennial generation who are now realizing they may never get to pay off their college loans and they are uh, in jobs that really cost more for them to get than they're actually yeah. going to make for them in some That's ways. Right. And we're getting That's financial right. advice from people who say, don't pay more for your college education than you expect to make in a year, which is just uh, mm -hmm. very difficult to oh, do. Wow, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, so you want to be able to pay back with a year's salary of what your, your... all of those roads lead to community colleges, though, yes, as an answer, yes. right? And, and you know what? The other thing about it is you get an excellent, excellent education. The faculty at I at Roxbury Community College are just terrific. They love these students. They love teaching, and they provide um, very high quality education. I think Shadia can probably tell you she has enjoyed her classes. Yes. she's enjoyed working with her faculty. Shadia, tell me a little bit. I've been uh, accidentally auditing my daughter's classes. She she goes to Bunker Hill Community College, and I can attest that I'm sure they are equal uh, to the great courses at Roxbury Community College's uh, college. At how difficult the courses are and the, how robust they are, how talented the professors and instructors are. Tell me about what one of your favorite courses was and um, what, what you took away from the educational experience. 
Well, overall, it was pretty amazing. Again, I feel like at Roxbury, we are more than just numbers. You know, teachers care about us, and that's what makes it exceptional. You just want to have the best grades, you know, because you have all the tools provided to you to do so. And my favorite class was... Uh, ITS problem solving with Professor Maya T. Bowen, that is actually my advisor. Yeah, that oh, was sure. very challenging. Yes, very, very challenging because you had to come up with solutions. You know, you got to get out of the box and you had to think. So it does help me in real life, even now. You know, there's not all, she, as she always says, there's not only one path to a solution. Like, this is what I give you, but there's so many other ways and that you got to figure out. And that's what I keep doing today. And it's just amazing. President, are we are we any closer to to having free community college? I know that it's affordable, and for mm -hmm. some students in Boston um, that graduate high school, they can they can go at a low rate or a free rate. And um, but are, are, do you see politically any will there? Uh, we're talking a lot about mm -hmm. forgiving past student loans, of course. Sure. But what about moving forward? What can we do to say mm -hmm. to citizens, we want you educated from first grade to high school? And we'd like you to be educated more. Well, I am just uh, so proud of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. If it's up to her, this will happen. And she has pledged that she is not going to give up on this fight. So it is something that is very much at the top of her list. And I think there are a number of other congressmen and congresswomen who have taken this challenge on. Uh, it's a matter of will in our country, political will, and gaining the momentum. Um, and I think, you know, we can spend billions and billions of dollars on tanks. Um, why can't we spend some dollars on educating our populace? And that is the position Congresswoman uh, Presley has taken and so many others. Uh, but let's not, um, you know, we can't forget that this will be a challenge. It is not um, going to be easy to make this happen, but I think that if we continue to talk about it, continue to understand the value of it, and to continue to understand how this kind of support and education for the populace can really help save our democracy. It's really part of uh, what, what has made this country great is that we have given education opportunity for people to make a way out. And so, um, I'm hoping that there will be the political will to make um, free community college education a reality, uh, but it will not be done uh, without education and without a fight, a fight, quite frankly. Shadia, what, is your speech written? Are you ready to go? Yes, I am ready to go. <laughs> What's the highlight? What's the theme? Just tell me what the theme is before we wrap up. The theme is pretty simple. Don't let anyone's opinion of you be your reality. You are the master of your life. You know, that's basically it. Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. If you can envision, I can't wait to hear it. If you can envision it, you can be it, right? With the right... Exactly. The, that's so great. Well, congratulations to you. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, you've, you've accomplished so much, and I'm sure everyone in your family is proud of you and your colleagues and friends. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us, and congratulations to both of you. Here's to a better year thank next you. year in school. Yeah, we're right? going to have a great day for Friday. Absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you. Night and sunshine. <laughs> That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow. Can Democrats win back rural voters? A winning progressive from conservative Maine shares her lessons learned in her new book, Dirt Road Revival. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching and stay safe.